Fifty years in science is a very long time, particularly during the last century when things happened so fast. When I started working just before that, the pi mason was discovered, which was considered to be responsible for forces between between protons and neutrons and so on, which kept the nuclei together. But after that, enormous number of discoveries happened, and it, one felt very lucky that one came in at that time. And I went to Tata Institute. We were just 15, 20 people at that time, not very many. A wonderful leader, Omi Baba, who had set up the Institute. Tremendously free atmosphere. And soon we got colleagues like Professor Bernard Peters, and I had young people of my age like Devendalal, Daniel and others. We didn't have nuclear accelerators in the country. At that time there were none really in the world which could work very much with these fundamental particles, but they were coming up. But uh, we knew that cosmic rays provide us with high energy particles. And uh, we also were conscious in our country that we are close to the geomagnetic equator where the background of low energy cosmic rays is very low. And if you want to work with high energy cosmic rays, it's an ideal location. Cosmic rays were discovered, of course, in the beginning of the last century when one found that there is something which comes from outside which ionizes air, which means there must be some charged particles or something coming which produces ions. And one found then ultimately that radiation comes from outside and not from the earth. One found that cosmic rays contain protons and actually sample of matter coming from outside at high energies, you know, various chemical elements, nuclear chemical elements. Enormous amount of activity in the universe is a very high energy activity. There are uh, supernovae in which fantastically high energy particles must be produced. There are, uh, of course, black holes and particles around there. One of the techniques with which I was involved very early on, I have done, worked with many techniques, was the nuclear emulsion technique. You take essentially pellicles of emulsion, which are sensitive to nuclear particles, for a large number of pellicles, you stack them up and you make a block. A particle comes and makes an interaction, and then its products go, and then you develop techniques after developing this, mounting it on glass, so that you can trace this particle under a very high-powered microscope. And you could expose this at a high altitude. So simultaneously, one needed capability in the country of flying balloons to high altitude. Fortunately, there was some beginning in that. Even Homi Baba had started doing this. And we had only meteorological balloons. And we used to tie 100, 120 balloons together in order to carry a small load up to 80,000, 100,000 feet altitude. Expose it for a while and come down and we'll recover it somewhere in some forests and so on and so forth. So development of the emulsion block detectors was done better here, probably for the first time in this country than anywhere else. What was amazing, this doing cosmic rays and following balloons all over the country, actually was a discovery of India. Going to the villages, spending time there. I saw many parts of the country which I wouldn't have been to otherwise. How come that these particles are produced so seldom? They are produced in nuclear interactions, so they should live only for 10 to the minus 24 seconds or so, but we see them living for 10 to the minus 8 seconds, which is much longer, 16 orders of magnitude longer. And this was the thing which somehow we hit. Professor Peters, who was with us at that time, Devendra Lal, myself, Daniel, and a few others. So we developed this technique. First hunt for a particle like this is decay mode in the block, emulsion block. Then trace that particle to the point of interaction in which it was produced. Then pick all the other, other particles, the uh, tracks which were there, follow them to their end, and to find out what happens. The associated production of some of these things was first discovered in India that particles are produced together, if they are strange. We discovered the first negative K-meson. When it stopped, it got captured and it produced other particles. Some of them were visible or not. Then 
uh, I went to America and I I worked with the in an accelerator, so I worked with a very large, world's largest cloud chamber with other colleagues. We have the pleasure of having with us today Professor Abdul Salam, one of the most distinguished scientists of our times, director of the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, which in fact he founded. He's of course Nobel laureate in physics. Professor Salam, you have yourself taken part in this big revolution which has occurred in physics and continues to occur. Why do you think uh, physics is so exciting and where is it going? Uh, physics has been transformed, particle physics we are talking about, has been transformed since, I should say, the middle of the 70s, which is now embodied in what's called the standard model yes. of particle physics. The standard model says that all matter is made up either of quarks, all the, all the hadron, protons and neutrons are made up of quarks, yeah. or it's made up of leptons, electrons yes. and neutrinos, or muons and their brothers, and so forth. So we enumerate 45 particles, still a large number, Yes. make them into three families of 15 each, which we say are the fundamental building blocks. The standard model then goes on to say that the four fundamental forces of nature are mediated by a set of 12 part, 13 particles which go between, which are messengers of these mm -hmm. forces. Now this totality of 45 plus 13 plus one more particle, the so-called Higgs, 14 particles, 59 altogether, makes up for all forces of nature whatsoever. The Three. forces being gravity, the force which keeps the nucleus together, That's right. nuclear forces, and the electric. force of electric force, electromagnetic force, and which is between charges and, and the magnetic force. And the force is the one which... Weak. The weak nuclear force which is responsible for radioactivity. That's right. Through interaction, new ideas develop. Neutrino experiments were going on, myself and then my students, who are now very famous scientists like Ramnath Kausik and Tandon and Rangarajan and Verma and others. We started working in cosmic rays in terms of phenomenology, understanding cosmic rays, how it is. So some of the best work in calculation of these types was done at that time. And actually it turns out that a lot of it, that kind of work now has been used very recently in trying to understand the peculiarity of neutrinos, mixing up neutrinos with each other. You need a large diameter tunnel because these high energy particles have to be bent around to come back in magnetic fields. Right. Essentially but the trouble is that the energy. electrons, mm. if they are very fast, emit radiation That's so right. much mm. that you will need to pump so much energy into it, the neutron does not have. So the larger the tunnel, the better the simpler because it is. Because once they bend at a smaller rate, Small, they radiate exactly. it less. So these accelerators will be ready in the 1990s and will answer questions about the correctness of our theory yes. to one-tenth of one percent accuracy. The hope is that there will be some small deviations. Discrepancy. That's, that's where the information is. That's, the that's mm. where the information lies. Those small discrepancies will then point the way towards newer particles, mm. which we have missed out in this count, and newer types of uh, thinking will arise. So the, the world has opened up. You don't see only in light, you see in many, many different, uh, different parts of the spectrum which comes. The universe speaks to us. And we have to find out how it speaks and what it says and what's going on. One was a product of uh, times when India was fighting for its independence. 
there was tremendous hope that whatever one was doing somehow would make a real difference to the country. So it was that generation one belonged to. And so the question of India and question of education and question of development never really left one's mind. Professor Yashpal, on 14th, 15th August 1947, how old were you and where were you? I was 20. Mm -hmm. And I happened to be in Delhi living with my parents on Hari Samad Road. What are the memories you have of that time? I had come to Delhi from Lahore to spend the summer vacation with my father. At that very time, when we came, it wasn't sure that would be, Pakistan would be accepted or not. When we came from Lahore, Lahore was already very disturbed. Delhi got very violent also, because refugees started pouring in, and there were a lot of communal riots in Delhi. The whole period was very heightened tensions, large number of refugees our own relatives coming yes. and waiting for them. And, well, it was a terrible experience, but there was also a feeling that something new is happening and something new would emerge out of that. When you say terrible, um, what... Terrible what? in terms of what people had gone through. Mm. They had lost mm -hmm. their relatives. We also knew what was happening on the other side. We also knew what was happening in Punjab to the Muslims. We saw what was happening here in Delhi. And one was certainly moved by small, minor interactions, even with people like Jawaharlal and others and so on, even Gandhiji, okay? Soon after I joined college, when I was 15, 16, I started wearing white homespun. Kurta pajama. No, I don't wear white. <laughs> but at that time, it used to be khadi. And one I read, read a lot about Gandhi and and Gandhi clearly had a message which was sociological in addition to being for independence. You know, I want to mention that for many people mm -hmm. of my generation who went into science because they did science. But there was also an underlying feeling that science is also for the country. We were influenced by Jawaharlal's rhetoric in this. And so that was the time when a large number of CSIR laboratories were open, one after the other. Matnaga was around. And then Homi Baba came, and Tata Institute was set up by yes. Homi Baba. And the atomic energy laboratories came, and a large number of laboratories started growing in the country. Are uh, using the future, building up from now onwards, atomic power for these peaceful purposes. But see, one has to remember at the time of independence in this country, we didn't even make a radio. Even our pencils were imported, erasers were imported, sure, watches sure. were not there. I mean, at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, which was the so-called cradle of the atomic energy program. Sure. It was beginning to grow there. Yes. We had to sit down, people had to sit down and wire all the circuits and valves mm -hmm. and so on and so forth right from the beginning. And so starting from that, going to the success of the atomic energy program in reactors, in metallurgy, in all kinds of things, was, I think, rather unexpected mm -hmm. by most people. And similarly, in space, we had nothing. Our, if our first rockets were carried on bicycles. The rocket zooms up, leaving behind a trail of success. From there to go to launchers, building satellites, mm -hmm. some of the best satellites in the world. This rather peculiar thing about Indian situation is that there are things which are considered by the world to be at the cutting edge and very difficult. Mm. Very few countries in the world have been able to do it. We have been able to do it. Why is it that what world considers difficult is easy for us and what they consider to be very easy, for example, providing sanitation and water, is very difficult for us? So it's a question of the social organization challenges and intent. Now, there was this rhetoric of self-reliance, mm -hmm. but self-reliance has been, has been operated only in those areas where we didn't get know-how from outside. 
let's say, supercomputers. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there was uh, uh, such a such a terrible thing uh, in uh, conditions which were put on getting supercomputers, and they were not allowed. I'm delighted they put conditions like this because mm -hmm. within a few years we developed our own, just as good as yes. as uh, as uh, we would have got from them. Industry has to start research in house. That's how products come out. Products never come out from laboratories sure, from universities. Sure. And industry has always been tied to this know-how transfer. And both in the industrial sector and also administrative sector, there was a certain degree of disbelief that India can do it itself. I dream, for example, of people getting together and trying to see how can we make now that technology can become so flexible it, it can be small electronics and chips and so on machines can be tiny they can be more intelligent just as Gandhiji wanted people to have a charkha and a sewing machine I can give a tiny robot to everybody which is under his control so can we think in terms of Gandhian robotics or Gandhian electronics which was not possible 50 years ago or 40 years ago so new science and technology has to be more sophisticated but more applicable to societal good. We don't have to build only highways, north to south, east to west and so on. What about pathways, pagdandis we call it? From there you begin to get all kinds of things merging together. And don't always define your state of high development in terms of what you see outside. Define it in terms of where you are and, and how happy people feel and how related they are and how they do not feel lonely in the middle of a crowd. In 1975, India embarked on a bold experiment to test, for the very first time in the world, the developmental and educational impact of direct television broadcast to remote villages. The experiment made use of the American satellite ATS-6 and was a cooperative venture between NASA and the Indian Space Research Organization. One of the key figures behind the satellite instructional television experiment was Professor Yashpal. You see, I was doing high energy physics, cosmic rays, mm -hmm. astrophysics, and one of the cosmic ray physicists at that time, a few years senior to me, was Vikram Sarabhai. Mm -hmm. And Vikram Sarabhai had this dream of uh, using satellites for bringing television to villages of India. People don't realize now how this unconnected we were. Telephones or television was not there and it was under Sarabhai. Department of Atomic Energy initiative was taken to put a hundred TV sets around villages in Delhi. But Sarabhai passed away in 71 and Dr. Satish Dhawan took over as yes, chairperson yes. and so middle of 72 uh, Satish Dhawan asked me whether I would move to Ahmedabad and organize the applications program of space including mm -hmm. the site experiment. Mm -hmm. now, I was very hesitant because it was complete change in my mm -hmm. career. The challenge being to develop all the ground equipment oneself not important. We built Earth Station ourselves, and some of the Earth Stations we built are still operating. They control our satellites. And that was the kind of team where we developed the front-end converters, the low-noise amplifiers, Earth Stations. First dish antennas were developed in India. People forget, not abroad. They were 15 or 20 built by NASA just to test the satellite which they loaned to us. But they ran in hundreds and thousands were built in India and tested in India. And we felt that we have a lead and we'll go on building on this lead and in the, all this area we will develop cameras, we'll develop new kinds of TV sets, new earth stations and cover the world also including ourselves. Wishful thinking. In 1976, Professor Yashpal was awarded the Padma Bhushan by the government of India for his outstanding contribution to the site experiment. 
In 1980, he received the Marconi Fellowship for his humane leadership in applying modern communication technology to meet the needs of isolated rural villagers in India. The International Fellowship Award for 1980 to Professor Yash Pal. Receive the award. Siyash Pal, director of the Space Evolution Center, receives the But the experiment was not only this hardware, the experiment was to prove that so you can do this in the villages of the country, far off villages where people had never seen even a moving picture. They had never even turned a knob on anything. They had no equipment on which there was a knob. To install these there, to operate these, to maintain these, and then the most important challenge, programming. We are in it not as engineers only. We are in it as uh, scientists. We are in it because we want to see what happens. So we like to get into programming. We like to tap, set up social evaluation. We like to do needs assessment surveys. Amazing part of that period is not what we achieved, amazing part of it is that in a technology center it was possible at that time to have as many as 250 social scientists working for 3-4 years. And we wanted to make Gujarati programs for nearby Khera district because we wanted to see what happens if you work close to the people rather than only through the satellite. So from the Khera experience one learns straight away that satellite broadcasting is good because it helps you to bridge the distance. But it's also bad if you use only satellite broadcasting because you're talking to people you don't know anything about. You may have done some surveys, but you don't know their language, but not only language, immediate concerns. You don't know what is happening, which road, which, which street is blocked, where little flood has happened, the whole dynamics of it. So you become distant. So you tend to sermonize and you have to develop a system in which the intimate and the distant mix together. And this I believe is so important even in the present day world that you need the intimate and the close and you need the distant so that you don't live, begin to live in a well. Professor Arthur C. Clarke visiting India again. Now Arthur C. Clarke to most people is not known as Professor Arthur C. Clarke because they have read so many of his books. I have a great, the greatest difficulty in categorizing him. Is he a writer? Is he a futurologist? Is he a technologist? Is he a scientist? In 1944, um, I was working on a very advanced microwave radar, ground control approach, yes. the torque bound system. And at the same time, I was in discussions with my colleagues in the British Interplanetary Society, ah, yes. the post war, the pre war space cadets, saying, How can we get people interested in space travel? And it was the combination of working on radar, communication technology, and thinking about satellites and rockets that melded together and gave me the concept of using satellites for radio and TV broadcasting. I have with me here today Dr. Andrew Witterby, who has contributed substantially to the revolution in modern communication. Satellites have come in, which have made a lot of difference. Optical fiber has come in. The wireless has been around for a long time. What are the special things tec technically, technologically, which are making the big difference? Absolutely. Uh, it began about 50 years ago with the, uh, what is sometimes called the solid state microelectronic revolution. Yeah where we took what was then a very high power, very clumsy, very large uh, technology and 
gained many orders of magnitude. We've gone from megabits or megahertz yeah. to gigabits and gigahertz per second. May I interrupt in a, in a layman's way of thinking? When you go digital, you can be more unambiguous because it's yes and no's. Yes, absolutely. And uh, so you don't have to say this big. You say yes and no, and so all information can be put in yes and no's, and you can be less ambiguous, absolutely. and you can tolerate more interference. Is that correct? Uh, that is absolutely correct. And the theory for all this was or originally developed almost at the same time that the transistor was invented. Shannon. By Claude Shannon, yes. exactly. Anything which is effective these days in changing people's minds unfortunately gets appropriated by those who want to change their mind for, uh, for selling things, for advertising. What will happen? You don't need any understanding, for example, to see which kind of toothpaste you should use. You just brainwash people. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are we humans are very susceptible to brainwashing. Partly because that's been done to young people from early on. What we call value education is many a times brainwashing of children. <laughs> Which finally leads to all kinds of problems later because you can't get away from the fact that you are a Hindu or a Muslim or a Sikh or Indian or a foreigner. So in some sense, media is working now by and large as an anti-education, anti thinking uh, enterprise the world over whether you should bomb Iraq or not everybody knows in their bones that the bombing and killing children and women and people no matter for what purpose is not going to serve that purpose it's for something else but you can persuade people that no 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 there's a great villain out there we, we must somehow bomb his whole country to, in order to capture him and destroy him. Unfortunately, all powerful things, media, etc., become subservient to that. And same also to corporations which want to advertise. What worries me is that as the communication interaction around the world has been increasing with the internet satellites yeah. internet everything i would have expected that some kind of thin universe of intimacy would have begun to descend on the planet but somehow just the reverse seems to be happening ethnic tensions are increasing people are getting into smaller and smaller huddles within countries and across countries within my own country even in your country. This effect of communication is seen by the human biology, almost, our human mind, almost as if it were a, a non-self organism coming in. Now, just as in the body, if there is an outsider, there are antibodies produced to protect you. And we feel somehow without wanting to, some kind of threat coming and we create defenses which are destructive both to us and to outsiders. What Absolutely. Do you think I think this? that's a very good point, a very good series of points that you've <laughs> made. I think a lot of it has to do with education. Maybe there is a bit of hope in the sense that if it is possible that everybody is connected and most people get connected in some form and if we can have essentially a worldwide web through which, in which you can talk without English, through gestures, through pictures, through movements, all kinds of things. And everyone can communicate his ideas, thoughts, his inventions, his ways of living to everybody else 
without somebody dictating that do this because that's the way I make more money that it might be possible to move towards a world in which you can abolish these poles of producers and the rest all being consumers. You will not demand that every place be uniform, that people live the same way. You can live your own way. ऑक्सीजन में दो एटम होते हैं ऑक्सीजन मॉलिक्यूल में ओजोन में तीन एटम होते हैं ऑक्सीजन के तो इतनी क्या बड़ी बात होगी तीन एटम हो गए तो खुदा बन गई क्या इतनी सारी ऑक्सीजन दो एटम वाली पड़ी है वो तीन वाली आके कहती मैं ओजोन हूं तुम्हारी जिंदगी बचाती हूं कैसे किसी को मालूम है पर तीन वाली क्यों अल्ट्रावायलेट को रोक लेती है दो वाली काफी नहीं है अगर सारी जितनी ओजोन है ना ऊपर उसको ला के जमीन पे इकट्ठा कर दिया जाए पता कितनी मोटी लेयर बनेगी इतनी आई थिंक ह्यूमन एनिमल लर्न बेस्ट फ्रॉम अदर ह्यूमन एनिमल्स और अदर एनिमल्स दैट इज वाई वी हैव स्कूल्स एंड कॉलेजेस एंड यूनिवर्सिटीज अदरवाइज वी शुड हैड ओनली लाइब्रेरीज and ask people to work in libraries that is why great music is created in a few places where there is a great musician and teacher around that is why the guru and the ustad is still important we got to all the science education in schools public schools first then municipal schools in bombay then in rural schools and one found that uh, whether it's science or education specificities are important you can use the same curriculum in municipal schools of bombay which you had to use yes. in rural schools it's also true that in terms of people we educate we have not been able to provide proper, proper opportunities to them many colleges and universities are very very poorly equipped we think those who don't go to school are completely uneducated i tend to believe that we have an enormous subterranean education system operating in our country through which farmers learn how to farm continuously without going to school how to use new seeds how to use fertilizer when to water when to sell when not to sell it is through such a system that jewelers sonars people who make our jewelry learn their craft and their art which involves engineering and metallurgy and everything whole lot of craftsmen make such beautiful things we don't call them designers because they can't speak english artists and painters many of the writers great writers if rabindranath had to have a degree before he started writing he would have never written and so what we have not done is in our urgency to get something out of our education we have separated the natural learning system which exists in our country from the formal system we have no connections A university should be a universe. People should be able to take a course in any anywhere. We shouldn't really teach people to make it easy to take their examination. We should have credits in a few things and then let the employer determine or the person determine whether he has had enough or she has had enough or not. This coupling has to be introduced because a lot of gaps which are in between unless they are filled no real problems can be solved 
As far as young children are concerned and their education is concerned, all I would say is please let us stop torturing children. Torturing them for nothing because we find that the learning is only for, for testing and examination, which is a horrible thing to do. Stop overloading them with information which they don't understand. Understanding is that which gives joy and pleasure. If they understand a few things, then later on as the world develops, they keep on understanding more and more. If they get into a habit of not understanding anything, then they haven't learned very much. I think let them taste the joy of understanding. I've asked children in Hindi, finally, let me use a few words in Hindi. What is understanding? Finally, we come to a consensus when I discuss let there be more and more maza. Maza word is fantastic, which you'll understand. Okay, there is a feeling of joy. Because whatever you have inside your brain, no matter where it came from, you begin to see its relationship. It begins to form a symphony. There is a symmetry which develops in there. Once that happens, then you pick on resources which you didn't even know you had to do all manner of things. How many great people during last century had 99.9% .9 marks? I think uh, Einstein didn't, nor did uh, Rabindranath Tagore, nor did Bill Gates. Very often, it's good to be a dropout. Don't worry about it in a positive sense. How come that while science flourishes, scientific temper diminishes? I don't think that by and large most scientists have a great scientific temper. Or the most industrialized country amongst his people who are powerful have a scientific temper. Okay? Power is acquired by some people. I think, for example, in the United States, they are amazing people very tremendously thinking people, philosophic people, kind people, who do anything for others, who well behaved, uh, remarkable. But in terms of powers, whether it's corporations or the government and the way they are elected, that's very different. You can have millions agitate in Europe, in America, everywhere, for example, for the war in Iraq. But all they have to say is, oh, don't worry about it. Once we start fighting and a few of our people die, patriotism will take over and everybody will support. Okay? This has been said. Wow, cynical. Okay? What is happening is a phenomenon that science is, uh, there is tremendous specialization. It's the age of experts. An expert is super specialist in medicine is an expert. He can't diagnose you by touching you or anything else. Chimile is super specialist in technology of one area or in sciences of one area. He is a super specialist in area. These super specialists essentially are people who can be called upon and used by others for their ends. Itna bada bam banao. Make such a big bomb or such kind of a bomb in which Buildings are not destroyed, but people get killed. It's a challenge. To a super specialist, it's a challenge. And he'll be involved with that challenge. He doesn't care what it will do. Okay? So there is to assume that every super specialist will also worry about the larger aspects of where the world is going. I think it's terrible. So I keep on saying that, heaven's sake, even if you are super specialist, Again and again, encounter, look at long perspectives of science, which you take you really to the very beginning of the universe, or beginning of life on the planet, how we came to be, archaeology, how we developed, how we learned to speak, what happened, how we had to be separate because we grew in small groups. This is the long perspective which should really control the values and thinking and really Mix with the ecology of the brain all the time, not values which are given to you by, by lecturing and by posturing and teaching you only about one religion or the other.
beyond all conventional religions, the most important thing are these perspectives. These are the only ones which will give you a scientific temper.